Thank you, James. It's uh, my pleasure to be here today to speak about uh, sensible solutions for our public lands, particularly better access, health, and productivity on our public lands. My name is Jennifer Fielder, and I am the CEO of the American Lands Council. We are America's voice for better access, health, and productivity on public lands. I also serve in the Montana State Senate. I was elected in uh, the year 2012 to represent a rural district in beautiful Northwest Montana. This is where I live. Uh, the people that I represent live here. And uh, you can see some photographs on this slide um, of snapshots from that area. I'm an active outdoors woman, as are many of the, uh, the women in my district, as well as um, these lands are enjoyed by men and, and children as well. These are great family activities to be able to get out on the landscape and enjoy the lands in a lot of different ways. Um, and not just enjoy, but these lands are important to the way that we live our lives as well. Um, whether it be gathering meat, whether it be um, getting some fish, growing a garden, breathing the clean air. Um, my district includes millions of acres of federally controlled lands and they really have a direct bearing on our life there. And I'm going to show that to you in the next few slides. But I wanna start with this map. This map is a map of the United States, obviously, and the red on it represents all of the land that is under the control of the federal government. These are actually lands owned by the United States government, federal lands. Actually, it's in the Western United States, over half of all of the land is owned and controlled by the federal government. And those decisions for those lands are made predominantly by people that live thousands of miles away, uh, members of Congress and the heads of these uh, giant uh, federal bureaucracies are the ones really in the driver's seat for the decisions that affect the Western lands. This is not only uh, not working, we believe it's also unconstitutional and uh, we need to do better and we can. We're gonna talk about some solutions, but first let's look at what this federal control is doing. Now, this is a very good example of a picture of a forest. This is a forest here, and you can see that there's a property line that separates the ownerships. And one side is locally controlled. It's an actively managed forest. It's healthy. It's at a much lower fire risk than the other side. It's an asset economically, socially, and environmentally. This forest has been periodically logged and thinned throughout the, the generations. On the other side, the left side of the screen, you see a federally controlled forest. And this side has been neglected for decades. It's ripe with dead, diseased, and dying trees. It's a very high fire risk, and it's a liability economically, socially, and environmentally. This is a close-up of a typical, untended, federally controlled forest. Basically, it's a catastrophic wildfire waiting to happen because what is, what is going on there is the trees are aging. They're, they're choking each other out because they're so close together. Um, and, and as they age, uh, the, those that survive uh, end up uh, decaying and falling down and creating these catastrophic wildfire conditions on the, on the landscape. And why is this happening? Why do we see these kind of conditions? Is it global warming? No, not exactly. It has a whole lot to do with how these lands are being managed, as you can see in the, the earlier slide with the two different uh, property ownerships. But um, the root of this really goes back to um, some federal plans that have been implemented over the last several decades. It's been going on for years. And uh, this particular plan that I really dug into was for the area of Northwest Montana and North Idaho. And I was wondering why the federal government was closing access and shutting down um, productive uses of our lands. And so I studied their, their draft plan. And the, the plan that they signed off on, and this was 2013, said in it that the selected alternative, in other words, the, the plan that they were choosing to go forward with, will limit our ability as resource managers to respond to fire, wind throw, insects and disease, and to provide timber or other commodities. Now, these reasons are the very reasons that this agency, the United States Forest Service, exists. They are supposed to be stewards of the land. They are supposed to respond to fire, 
and wind throw and insects and disease and provide timber and other commodities for our nation. But yet they've chosen a plan to govern these lands for the next 20 years. It does just the opposite. Why would they do that? Well, and how would they do that? One of the cruxes of the plan was that they were um, claiming that they needed to close roads in order to protect the, uh, the forest lands. And so we've seen an increasing number of gates go up across roads. We've also seen um, in, in this particular plan a commentary that they needed to not only put gates on the public access roads on public lands, but they needed to destroy the roads to the point that they were impassable to foot traffic. So this is an example of one of those areas. The reason that they gave for doing this was that they claimed that grizzly bears avoid roads and therefore in order to help recover grizzly bear populations we needed to uh, remove or obliterate or close roads. And it was uh, very um, interesting that they came to these conclusions that affected literally millions of acres of our public lands. They came to these conclusions based on the study of two bears. Two bears, a sow and her offspring, were studied a, about two mornings a week, just a few hours per morning, with old uh, scientific uh, collection known as um, radial telemetry. This is when the biologists would actually go up in small aircraft, a pilot would fly them around, they would have a, um, a unit, a transponder unit, that would pick up the signals from these collared grizzly bears, and they would locate where the grizzly bears were at. So they did this two hours, a couple hours uh, uh, a morning, two days a week. Um, the reason that they weren't doing this more often is because a, a number of biologists were actually being killed in the, in the flights that went on beyond the early morning hours because the air currents in the mountains changed so much. So um, they, they decided to go to this system of just going up in the early morning hours when the air was very predictable. And from this data, they concluded that bears avoid roads. They actually ignored the data that showed bears go wherever the food sources are because grizzly bears need to eat 12 months worth of food in a six month period. There was some data though that um, they conveniently left out and this was from a, um, a PhD thesis that was overseen by the director of the interagency grizzly bear committee. Um, he's the one that oversaw these other um, conclusions that said grizzly bears avoid roads and signed off on that. But yet this data here shows GPS tracking data on 19 grizzly bears also in northwest Montana. These readings were taken 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it shows where the grizzly bears were going. Now, just for reference, this is uh, south of Glacier National Park. You can see Flathead Lake up in the upper left corner of the screen. And the area where the grizzly bears are spending their time is the Swan Valley. This is an active populated area. It's, it's got uh, plenty of roads. It's got some paved roads. It's got plenty of dirt roads. Um, it's a somewhat populated area. It's, it's northwest Montana, so it's still rural. But nonetheless, the bears are spending most of their time there. And up in the wilderness that you see up on the upper right part of the screen, um, bears are not frequenting that area very often at all, and, and this is the area where there are no roads. So this conclusion that grizzly bears avoid roads and therefore we have to shut down our national forests, um, it just didn't make any sense. And um, if you take a look at federal lands through the decades, and you look at what they have been doing, you will see that about 2,000 miles of access roads have been closed per year. There has been a long-standing agenda to find reasons to close the roads. Um, the grizzly bear was one excuse. There are many others that are being used throughout the country. Um, basically pick a, a species, and uh, you can find that the agenda is to try to shut down access to our public lands uh, and, and, and use of other lands as well. Um, and you will see that over the last 30 years, timber harvest has been reduced on, on federally controlled lands by 70 percent. So that means less logging, uh, less access, and you couple that with a, um, a, a systemic dysfunction within the federal agencies themselves. Um, in their own words, the, uh, the people that work in these agencies will admit that the system is broken. It's just not working. They want to take better care of the lands, but um, the system doesn't allow for it. <clears throat> 
And so what we are seeing as a result of that, one of the problems is about 10 times more acres burned per year on federal lands than we had uh, just three, four decades ago. Uh, this chart shows a 20-year period. You can see the green line represents a decrease in timber harvest over that 20-year period, and the red line represents the increased acreage burn. There is a direct correlation. Also, um, grazing is on the decline. Uh, grazing is another form of vegetation management. Well-managed grazing it can actually be very good for the landscape. And um, what we have been seeing is a, a number of reasons to drive ranchers off of the landscape and actually preclude them from being able to graze the grasses. And we're seeing noxious weeds take over. Um, some ranchers in Oregon were recently uh, imprisoned because they lit a um, range management fire that would control noxious weeds on the rangeland. It was their rangeland they lit the fire on. Um, they also had a, a grazing right on thousands of acres of adjacent federal land and uh, their range management fire spread to a little bit of the federal land and they were um, basically tried as terrorists or arsonists for burning federal land. Um, fortunately, um, President Trump got to the bottom of that and pardoned these ranchers in Oregon um, as they should have never been locked up for that type of thing. The typical penalty for a rancher whose range management fire encroaches upon federal land is called a trespass burn, and they're cited for that. They're given oftentimes a warning, sometimes a ticket, and a fine. But uh, unfortunately, under the Obama administration, they chose to prosecute these ranchers as, as terrorists under the uh, Anti-Terrorism and Death Penalty Act of 1991. It was a horrible thing. President Trump did correct that. We're very grateful for that. Um, let's take a look at this chart. This is about a 100-year period. Uh, these are uh, acres burned in the 11 western states over that period of time. And you see in the center, um, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, the um, vegetation management on the landscape was very active. Uh, logging was prolific. Grazing was prolific. And you can see during those periods that also the amount of acres burned was uh, very minimal. We saw an average of about a half million acres burning in the western states during that period of time. But then these federal regulations were put into place, um, particularly the uh, Endangered Species Act in the mid-1970s and then the Federal Land Management and Policy Act in the 1980s. And as those um, different pieces of federal policy and several other regulations started to clamp down on uh, timber and grazing, we saw a buildup of fuels on the landscape and we saw an increase of the number of acres burned. It's really not rocket science. You have more fuels out there. You have larger and more intense fires. And what these fires are doing are actually spewing uh, deadly toxins into our air. And the old normal in the western United States in the summertime uh, used to be characterized by scenes like this where we had beautiful clear days. But the new normal now tends to be this, smoke-filled toxic days. And these days uh, string together for weeks and months on end in a normal summer now here in the west. In fact, in my hometown of Thompson Falls, the street lights were actually coming on during the middle of the day because uh, they thought it was... Uh, the, this, the light sensors thought it was dark. Um, that's how thick the smoke is. And it's not just when the fire's nearby. This blanket of smoke is covering areas that are literally hundreds of miles. And um, another impact of these fires, it's often overlooked uh, by the leaders of the environmental community, is the fact that millions of animals are being burned up in these fires every year and they're starving as their habitats burned as well. The other animals that survive the fires are being burned out um, or starved out because their habitats burned. So this little bear cub actually made it out. Um, they had nicknamed her Cinder Bear. She made it out of a fire on federal land. She got to an adjacent property owner's house and she was saved and uh, turned into the authorities and they actually rehabilitated her and nursed her back to health and then released her. But does it do any good um, if she's released back into national forest land where the trees are so thick that all it takes is one lightning strike? And when a fire gets going in conditions like that in a neglected, untended national forest, once it gets going, unless you get on it and put it out right away during fire season, there's really no stopping it. 
and for some there's no escape like this cow that tried to outrun a fire was actually trapped between two trees because the trees are so close together on federal land due to lack of logging this big buck couldn't outrun a wildfire neither could this mountain lion and if those big animals can't outrun the wildfires, what do you think is happening to all of the little ones? And as these fires on federal lands get out of control and rage out of control, they, they oftentimes spread onto adjacent private land. And as they do that, they're destroying pets and livestock and homes. And as we saw last year in, in the national news, so many, so many homes and so many lives were lost in Paradise, California. Well, that type of devastation that happened in Paradise, uh, California was dramatic because of the number of people impacted. But that same type of devastation has been happening in Western communities for the last couple of decades, just on a smaller scale because it's in more rural areas where there's less people impacted. But nonetheless, the impacts are just as devastating to those people. And if you take a look at the data from a 10-year period, and this is a very conservative estimate, um, about 120 million wild animals are being burned up on federal lands per year, and 4 billion pounds of toxic pollution are being emitted into our skies from federal fires. And it's not just wildlife, it's not just people, um, our infrastructure is under uh, imminent risk as well. Um, this is a report that was given by the United States Department of Agriculture in 2013. They went around visiting with Western state uh, legislators and public service commissions and uh, gov governors and executive branches, et cetera, to um, warn us that there was 10,000 miles of electrical transmission lines on national forest lands at risk. And the primary reason for the risk was the lack of vegetation management. Now, the lack of vegetation management was for a variety of reasons. In some cases, um, many cases, it was because they were being litigated by the environmental community not to manage the timber. In other cases, they, they didn't have the funds to be able to take care of uh, preventing the wildfires before they started. A lot of the money was being spent on the back end of trying to control wildfires after they started, which is uh, very inefficient use of funds. Um, but if you look at the, the, the report cover that the United States Forest Service produced in 2013, mind you, this is under the Obama administration. The title is Forest Health and Western Utilities, but look at the picture they chose. So it's not uh, just the current administration that's bringing attention to the, the, the problem with wildfires and lack of vegetation management. These people in the agencies have known it for decades, and they've been trying to warn us. Um, but the system is just so crazy. We call it, instead of bureaucracy, we call it bureaucracy now. Because um, this is one example. Um, the feds actually blocked state fire crews from being able to put out the wildfires. In Montana, we have some of the best wildland firefighters in the world. We know um, how to fight these mountain fires unlike anyone else. The air currents are different. The, the conditions are different. The terrain is different. Um, Western forests are much different than eastern forests. So. Um, they are very unique, but when our state fire teams went in with helicopters to put out some of these small fires that uh, started up in August due to several lightning strikes, um, the federal government actually told our teams that they had to stand down because those fires were on federal land. Now, this was a few years ago, um, but it happened uh, several years, um, and the reason that they gave was that the Montana state helicopters were not on the list of federally approved equipment. Our helicopters carry more water and they travel faster than the, the, the aircraft that were contracted by the federal government. But nonetheless, um, our, our crews were told to stand down until federal crews came in. And that took um, several days. And by then it was too late. And literally millions of dollars in timber assets went up in smoke. Our uh, watersheds were destroyed. Our air was polluted and wildlife burned up for no good reason. And this is another example of the bureaucracy. This is um, Congress's idea to, the, to how to solve this problem of the lack of vegetation management. It's something they've kicked around for many, many years. Um, in 2013, they decided to come up with uh, emergency treatments in the Farm Bill. 
and they were going to expedite treatment in the areas that were under immediate imminent risk. And in Montana, um, they identified 5 million acres under imminent risk. And um, when these uh, agency people came in at uh, legislative hearings in the state of Montana, they were telling us that um, this was going to be the solution. The Farm Bill would allow these expedited treatments in the imminent risk areas. We've got 5 million acres identified, and everything's going to be great because we're going to get this taken care of. And I asked the question, I said, how many acres a year are you going to be able to treat? And they were very reluctant to answer that question, but I pushed. And I said, if everything went well, if you weren't litigated and if you had the funding, how many acres could you treat? And the answer was, we think we can treat about 5,000 acres per year if all things go well. And I quick did some math and <laughs> was astounded when I realized that they were talking about a thousand year period of time at that rate. And this is an emergency that the federal government was going to handle. So another example of bureaucracy. So my question to the people that are at this uh, United Nations uh, summit this weekend, this week, is um, why are you ignoring this? Why, why are you not uh, showing the pictures of the burned up wildlife? Why are you not concerned about the air pollution that's coming from these federal fires? Um, don't we all want healthy air, water, and wildlife? Don't we all want abundant outdoor recreation opportunities on our public lands? And don't we all want safe, vibrant communities? Neglect does not protect. This large federal bureaucracy from thousands of miles away, controlled by politicians that don't live here and don't have uh, the same concern for the Western lands that we here in the West have, that coupled with this um, unbending, lock it up and let it burn agenda that's being pushed from climate alarmists and for-profit environmental organizations, these are factors that have been causing the problems, not solving the problems. Because our environment is not a museum, we can't just lock it up and let it burn. Our environment is a garden. It's a very slow growing garden, but when it's tended properly, it can benefit both man and nature. But decades of federal land mismanagement has been increasingly over the decades producing dirty air, polluted water, decimated wildlife, blocked access, and economically devastated, depressed, unsafe communities. But the good news is there's a better path and I hope you're listening. Because if we all get on the same page for really caring about our environment, really caring about our communities, and really caring about access on our public lands, then we have got to find a better way. And there is a better path. And the American Lands Council is leading the charge. Because we have learned that you tend to get better decisions when they're made by people closer to the subject matter. In fact, the socialist country of Canada figured this out and transferred control of all of their federal lands to the territorial and provincial governments. Because who cares more about the air we breathe and the water we drink and the lands that surround us than the people who live right there? The people that live there and work there and play there and raise their families there, who cares more than we do? Somebody 2,000 miles away, 5,000 miles away? I don't think so. Here's the solution. It's time to entrust our public lands to local management that cares. And the way we do that is we transition the poorly managed federal lands to state ownership so that we can actually help get, these, get this trend turned around. 
and en enact some common sense solutions for our lands and our environment. Um, some have, have questioned the uh, legality of this, um, but the United States Constitution is clear, Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2, clearly states that Congress has the power to dispose of property belonging to the United States. They can transfer federal lands to the states or to anybody else they want. Do states have a right to be treated equal? Absolutely. In fact, this question in regards to public lands was addressed by the United States Congress and the Supreme Court many times. And going back to the older records, the United States Constitution annotated 1938, also the 1924 edition, said this on the public land question. It said the right of every new state to exercise all the powers of government which belong to and may be exercised by the original states must remain unquestioned except for one thing except so far as they are temporarily deprived of control over the public lands. Congress was never meant to keep our public lands forever and ever and ever. They were, the states were temporarily deprived of control. The lands were supposed to be transferred. There's enormous volumes of documentation on that. Um, we don't have time to go into those details today, but here's, here's one thing you might be interested in. Has this ever been done before? Absolutely yes. Right now in the western United States, there are approximately, approximately 40 million acres of state-owned public lands that are being managed pretty darn good. And uh, these lands are producing positive revenues for the state through proper resource management, and they are complying with all of the environmental laws, and we are not seeing the strife and conflict over the use of these lands that we're seeing with federal lands. Can states afford to keep the public lands public? Um, opponents of local control will argue that they can't, but that is um, actually quite incorrect. If you look at the, the actual data, on uh, economically, the states that have public lands are outperforming the federal government, sometimes by 10 to 1 or better. In every case, the states are outperforming the federal government economically, as well as environmentally. So, what are the pathways forward? I'm just going to touch on these pretty quick. Um, number one, we need to um, persuade and convince our president and his administration that they need to do all within their power to transfer management and regulatory power to the states and to support this shift from federal to local control. Number two, um, we need to come alongside the state of Utah, which is leading the charge for the legal case at the Supreme Court level. They have been mounting a case. They've done extensive uh, analysis of the legal right of the state to be treated equal and to govern its own lands and resources. Um, and basically, when this case does go before the Supreme Court, we believe that the decision will be that Congress must honor statehood equality and must extinguish federal title to the land. But we also believe the court won't tell Congress how to do that, only that they must. So um, it's very important to have a piece of thoughtful legislation that will allow for the orderly transition of federal lands to states as they are willing and ready. Um, that piece of legislation uh, should have some key factors in it, uh, key components that would ensure that this is a win-win-win for everybody. And we believe we have um, those key components identified here in what we are calling the National State Lands Act. And number one, the states would be able to go at their own pace in acquiring lands so they wouldn't uh, all of a sudden have this large-scale burden uh, placed upon them all at once. States would identify which areas of land uh, they seek to acquire, when they seek to acquire them, and put forward a, a conveyance schedule. And this piece of federal legislation would allow the states and the federal government to work together on that uh, conveyance. Um, number two, that the state legislature, when they apply for the lands, would have to state what the purpose of the land is. And if they say that it will be public land um, for public purposes, then they must um, honor that promise. They would be required to do that. So there have been some concerns that um, the states would do something different with the lands after they got hold of it. But um, this piece of legislation would require the state to be very upfront and transparent through the legislative process in declaring what the purpose for the land acquisition would be and then to administer it for that purpose. And in fact, several state constitutions already require that, but we are proposing that that would be in the federal bill so that all states would have to administer the lands um, the way they say they will. 
And number three, the state would have to coordinate with the county resource management plan where the lands are located. That's very important so the local people have a very strong voice and so local knowledge can drive the governance of the resource management on these lands uh, where, the, where the impacts of those decisions really um, affect the people the most. And then any existing mineral, grazing, or water rights that are already protected on federal lands would also be protected when the lands are transferred to the state. Um, and the resource revenues would pay for land management. Um, if you manage the resources properly, you can actually produce uh, revenues that can provide um, monies for the land management, for the public access facilities, um, to do some very nice things on the landscape. And um, if you do a good job, you're actually going to have some revenues left over as well, as we've been seeing with several of the state-owned public lands. They're actually producing revenues that support schools, roads, uh, veterans' homes, and things like that. So state and local budgets could really get a boost from keeping the money in the state and managing these resources better. Local control really is the only solution big enough. Global control and federal control has brought us to where we're, we're having these troubles today. Um, it's been decades of, uh, unfortunately, learning the hard way. It's time to learn from our mistakes and really get together on the only solution big enough. And if you'd like more information, we'd invite you to visit our website at theamericanlandscouncil.org. And uh, feel free to contact us, and we'd encourage you to join us as well. Thank you.